Good to be with you guys. If you have a Bible, open to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. This is pretty much just going to be a sermon. Um, we're gonna seek, I'm going to seek to apply some of the truths that we see in the last part of Deuteronomy 4 and the first part of Deuteronomy 5 um, to the, the task and work of abolishing abortion. I usually read the whole text before I preach, but I want to do my best to stay on time, so we'll just read it as we, as we come to it. In both history and folklore, we find stories of people who took upon themselves the oath of a life debt. Maybe you've heard of that before. One person saves the life of another, after which the person saved takes an oath to serve uh, the one who saved him for the, for the rest of his or her life. Whether, whether delivered from uh, financial debt or delivered from certain death, the one delivered became duty-bound to the deliverer. As Christians, in a similar way, we owe our Lord Jesus Christ a life debt. On one hand, for our sin debt, we, we do not owe Jesus anything because He paid it all on the cross. But on the other hand, we owe Him everything. All our worship, all our love, obedience, service, honor, even our very lives. Not because there is anything left unpaid with regard to our sin, but because Jesus paid it all. As part of our life debt to our Lord, we also owe our neighbors the gospel. And we owe our neighbors our love. We are duty bound to our deliverer. And this certainly applies to our duty in working to abolish abortion. We, we find this principle of being duty bound to the deliverer at work in our text this evening. We'll get to it shortly. When we, what we see in the first portion of, of our text summarizes much of what has come before in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Moses is transitioning from an introduction of Israel's history to instruction for their future. He has been building up to his declaration and exposition of the law throughout the book thus far, getting ready to deliver their duty to them. He has shown how ever since God delivered Israel from slavery in Egypt, so long as they trusted Him and obeyed Him, they have prevailed over their enemies and prospered in their pursuits. By obeying God's law, doing their duty, Israel will live and they will take and keep the land that God is giving them. The delivered are duty-bound to their deliverer. And Christian, this must not disturb or displease you because as we'll see, and this would be the main idea for my message, duty becomes delight when received through deliverance. Duty becomes delight when received through deliverance. In the text, we'll see three truths that should embolden us. And first, what we see in our text is that deliverance reveals the devotion of the deliverer. Deliverance reveals the devotion of the deliverer. In verses 44 through 49 in Deuteronomy chapter 4, look with me at verse 44. It says, this is the law or the Torah that Moses set before the people of Israel. And while the word law is used in various ways in the Bible, in this context it seems to refer to the law covenant itself and the whole corpus of laws that Moses will declare and explain to Israel. And, and verse 45 makes this clear by specifying the law as the testimonies, statutes, and rules. These are the articles of God's covenant with Israel. The testimonies being the, the testimony of the ten words as we see it in, in the book of Exodus. These, this is the ten commandments which God, himself first, uh, which God Himself wrote on stone tablets. And it's the same universal moral law of God first written by God on man's heart. Statutes and rules, however, are the applications of the ten commandments and 
These are the ceremonial and civil laws written by Moses, not on stone tablets, but in a book. Not placed in the Ark of the Covenant, but placed by the side of the Ark of the Covenant. But this is neither a a new covenant nor new laws for Israel. In verse 45, we're reminded of, of when Moses first set the law before the people of Israel. It says, which Moses spoke to the people of Israel when or after they came out of Egypt. Now, as we'll see, this, this expressly describes when he reissued the law to Israel's second generation. But the reference to Egypt naturally draws our minds back to when God first gave his law to Israel. That is, after he had delivered them out of slavery. This is important for us to notice. The law of God is given to the people of God after the deliverance of God. And now in this second giving of the law to Israel, we see the devotion of God to Israel by completing what he started in Egypt and renewing his covenant with his people. Israel's whole experience over these 40 years has truly been one of deliverance. And further to this point, notice where Moses set the law before the people of Israel this second time. Look with me at the, at the first part of verse 46. Moses reissues the law to Israel beyond the Jordan in the valley opposite Beth Peor in the land of Sihon, the king of the Amorites who lived at Heshbon. In Genesis 15, God promised the land of Canaan to Abraham but told him that his descendants would sojourn in Egypt for 400 years before returning to Canaan because the sin of the Amorites, Canaan's current residence, was not yet complete. The sin of the Amorites was not yet complete. By the way, do you know what the sin of the Amorites was? Leviticus 18 tells us that it was first all manner of gross sexual sin along with the abomination of sacrificing their children to Molech. You can't separate sexual sin from the sin of abortion, child sacrifice. God declares there in verse 24 in Leviticus 18 that by all these, all these sins, the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean. But their wickedness was, had not yet reached its fullness, and, but now it has, and God is giving the land to Israel. Verse 46 reports that Moses and the people defeated the Amorites that were in in the off the northeastern border of Israel. And how did they defeat them? By the might of their own strength and skill? No. God caused the Amorites to fear Israel. And he gave them into their hand. We see in chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. And I commanded Joshua at that time, Your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings. So will the Lord do to all the kingdoms into which you are crossing. You shall not fear them, for it is the Lord your God who fights for you. And then in our text, verse The last part of verse 46 repeats again. When God delivered the Amorite kings into Israel's hands, it was when or after they came out of Israel. Egypt. Deliverance after deliverance. And Moses further emphasizes God's deliverance in verses 47 through 49. He, he notes all the territory that he gave them there off that northeastern, off the, the, north, the eastern side of the Jordan River. He, he gives the whole expanse of the territory they took. And it's the fourth time that he's detailed this in the book of Deuteronomy. He tell, gives all of the, the borders and the land that they were given. And he keeps doing this in part to stress God's generous devotion in his deliverance not only brought them out of slavery, he has brought and is bringing them into a vast inheritance. And now his law will be given again so that those he has delivered might be preserved and protected in the land and so that his purposes in the world might be furthered through them, namely the sending of the Messiah, our deliverer. Friends, if you have been delivered in and by Jesus Christ, you too have your deliverer's devotion. I think it's important for abolitionists to know that. You have your deliverer's devotion. Whether you are a pastor or a parent, a business owner, a a student, a, a civil magistrate, whomever you are, whatever you do, if you are a Christian, 
your deliverer has proven his unfailing devotion to you. And his devotion extends to you and for you in every station you occupy so that you can carry out your part in his purposes. And this certainly applies in the work of abolishing abortion. So whether you are pleading for the pre-born at the abortion mills or petitioning legislators to abolish abortion at the Capitol tomorrow or plotting yourself to enact legislation, you need to know that you have the devotion of your all-powerful deliverer in all your labors. He who has all authority in heaven and on earth calls those he has delivered to join him in delivering others and also promises to be with you always to the end of the age, that is, until he has completed his conquest. So, let us rest in his devotion to us, and keep our hands to the plow as he delivers others through us. So not only does deliverance reveal the devotion of the deliverer, next we see that deliverance brings duty to the delivered. Brings duty to the delivered. Verses 1 through 3. Now Moses begins to declare Israel's duty to them. Verse 1 picks up where the narrative left off. In chapter 4, verse 43, and says Moses sum- summoned all Israel. These words serve to call attention to the significance and the consequence of what follows. The almighty creator of the cosmos is again condescending to renew his covenant with Israel. Moses summons all Israel, the people delivered out of Egypt and delivered through 40 years of sojourning in the wilderness and delivered to the promised land. Moses summons them and said to them, "Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules I speak in your in your hearing, literally your ears that I speak in your ears today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them." The Hebrew word for hear carries along with it the sense of not just hear, not just listen, but hear and obey. This is why Israel must hear and learn the law and be careful to do it. Deliverance brings duty to the delivered and that duty is the law of God. We clearly see here with Israel, we, we see this with Israel, but the same is true for New Covenant believers In Christ, we're not duty-bound in all of the same ways as Israel, but we must obey Christ. The law is not advice or suggestions or wishes, but rather His holy and righteous standard. God's law flows from and reflects His character. In it, He reveals His will to His people. The Israelites were not only to listen and be aware of God's law, they were to respond in unqualified obedience, ordering every aspect of their lives to God's law. What reason does Moses give? Verse 2, Yahweh our God made a covenant with us in Horeb or Sinai. This is a renewal of the existing covenant that he initiated with them 40 years before. Covenants are oftentimes equated with promises, but that's really kind of a truncated definition of a covenant. They typically include promises, but that's only one element of a covenant. They also include parties and obligations, penalties, promises, rewards, and often signs or symbols to ratify and and to show who actually belongs to the covenant. And a covenant brings benefits for the parties for sure, But those benefits come with duties. Verse 3, we see in our text, Not with our fathers did Yahweh make this covenant, but with us who are all of us here alive today. Here, Israel's duty to God is emphasized as well as God's obligation and devotion to Israel. Moses called them to the foot of Mount Sinai. The people said, We will will hear and do whatever he says. They pledged their devotion, and Moses reported that back to the Lord. Joel Beakey says, Covenant is the way that God carries out that which he has bound himself to do. And for Israel, the covenant would also be the way that they would carry out that which they had bound themselves to do. 
Moses says this covenant was made with Israel as a whole and not with their fathers. Their fathers being Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who who had died without receiving the promises of the land and descendants and and a great name, etc. This generation of Abraham's descendants, however, would finally receive what God had promised. Which is what he had foretold Abraham. They would receive and enjoy and keep what God had promised to Abraham if they did their duty. By keeping the law of his covenant. The law covenant conditioned the, the blessings of the covenant given with, to Abraham. If they obey the law, they will enjoy the blessings. If they fall into a pattern of disobedience, the, the blessings will be lessened or, or lost. And, and God will send curses instead. It's a conditional covenant. And whether Israel will remain in the covenant and receive the blessings of it depends on their keeping the law of the covenant. Deliverance brings duty to the delivered. Friends, similarly, if you are in Christ, you too are duty-bound by covenant. Apostle Paul teaches us this idea in his letters. He first gives us the indicatives, all that Christ has done for us and given to us in his saving work. And then he gives us the imperatives. In light of the gospel, now do this. We are duty-bound to our Deliverer, our King, Jesus the Christ. The difference between Israel and us in the New Covenant is that they were to obey God's law for temporary life in the land, while we, by the Spirit, obey God's law from eternal life. Edward Fisher says, here is the difference. The one saith, do this and live, and the other, that being the New Covenant, says, live and do this. We don't obey God for deliverance to eternal life, but because we already have it. But I wonder, is the thought of being duty-bound to Jesus, your deliverer, off-putting at all to you? I'm, I'm fairly confident that at least most of us in this room this evening or, or watching on, on, their, on their phones, maybe, or uh, laptops, I'm confident that... Most of us are here because we are already deeply devoted to and active in the cause of abolishing abortion. But perhaps you're here or watching and you're you're mostly curious at this point. Or maybe you, you don't agree with abolition at all, or at least not entirely. I'll say it plainly. If you have been delivered from sin and death by Jesus, then you are duty bound to follow Jesus in delivering others. From sin and death. Proverbs 24.11, a well-known verse to us. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. Psalm 82.4, rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. This is what makes the cause of abolishing abortion a genuine gospel issue. Just as we forgive because we have been forgiven... And just like we we seek to deliver others, especially the helpless and most vulnerable, because we have been delivered, we must labor for others' eternal life, but also for their physical life. Christian, whoever you are, whatever your station, you must show mercy because you've been shown mercy. Do your duty. And as delivered people, our duty must not be off-putting to us. Because lastly, deliverance makes duty into a delight. As we consider the text as a whole, we, we see that this is what should be the result for Israel even. And in the New Testament, we find that this is the result for Christians who receive our duty from our Deliverer. From His hand. Likewise, left to ourselves when brought before God into His holy presence without a mediator, fear rather than faith is the proper response. But with a mediator, we can not only have our duty declared to us, we can even delight in it. We can delight in the duty of being obedient to work for abolition. Look with me at verse 4. Yahweh spoke with you face to face at the mountain out of the midst of the fire. Face to face is a figure of speech that means personally or directly. And and in this case, it describes the awesome and immediate manner in which God spoke to Israel. 
He spoke directly. He spoke solemnly, fearfully, at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire. His voice was unmistakable and audible. His presence was manifested in an awesome, visible display of His power and glory. Moses goes on. He says, This is happening while I stood between Yahweh and you at that time to declare to you the word of Yahweh. Moses stood between God and Israel as their mediator. They all heard the voice, but Moses would declare to them the word of God. As their mediator, he would teach them and apply it to them in their situation. And this was all the more necessary when we see their fear to come near and hear from God. It says, For you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up into the mountain. This generation were only children at Sinai, but they were there nevertheless. They saw the demonstrations of His power in Egypt and in the wilderness. They likely had vivid memories, but Moses points out later in the book that their children did not have those memories. They did not see all that their parents saw. Most crucial for this generation and every generation to follow was the worship of God. And the law of God has the chief aim of preserving His worship as well as His worshipers so that these things would be passed on were absolutely critical. It was not for no purpose that Moses declared in verse 6, I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Matthew Henry said, Their present triumphs herein were a powerful argument. For obedience. Nevertheless, the Apostle Paul tells us that Moses' ministry was one of death and condemnation, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, because the letter or the law kills. This compounded with the awesome and threatening display of God's presence is why Israel was afraid because of the fire and they did not go up into the mountain. The law itself cannot give life, eternal life. In fact, the law requires the lives of all who break it. Galatians 3, 21 and 22. If a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Matthew Henry said herein, Moses was a type of Christ who stands between God and man to show us the word of the Lord, a blessed daysman or mediator that has his, laid his hand upon us both so that we may both hear from God and speak to him without trembling. Second Timothy 2 says that there is only one mediator between God and man, the, the man Jesus Christ who gave himself a ransom for all. And as our mediator, Christ also mediates the law of God to us as our prophet, priest, and king. Christ has certainly redeemed us from the curse of the law, but not from the command of the law. In fact, Jeremiah 31, 33, as a blessing to the new covenant, of the new covenant that Christ mediates, God promises, I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. Similarly, Ezekiel 36 25 through 27, God promises to give us new hearts. And having written His law, His moral law anew, on those new hearts, He promises to cause us to obey His law. You see, the law of God comes to Christians not from the blazing mountaintop, but instead in the hand of Christ. In the hand of Christ who fulfilled and kept it for us and now instructs and directs us with it by His Spirit. And this is why we must not despise our duty, but rather delight in it. For those who trust in Christ alone as their mediator, He has kept the law in your place and He now instructs and directs you with His law and enables you to keep it. John Calhoun said, The love of God to man is the sum of the gospel. The love of man to God is the sum of the law. And love to God and our pre-born neighbors requires that we delight in our duty to deliver them. Question 74 of the Baptist Catechism asks, What is forbidden in the Sixth Commandment? Answer, the Sixth Commandment absolutely forbiddeth the taking away of our own life or the life of our neighbor unjustly. 
or whatsoever tendeth thereunto. And before that, question 73 asks, What is required in the Sixth Commandment? Answer, the Sixth Commandment requireth all lawful endeavors to preserve our own life and the life of others. Friends, in closing, I'll say it again. If you have been delivered by Jesus Christ, then you are duty-bound to follow Him in delivering others. And duty becomes delight when received through deliverance. So as Christ has delivered you, take your duty from His hand and go in faith to the Capitol tomorrow and call on our legislators to do their duty by delivering those being carried away to death. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your kindness and your mercy that you've shown us in Jesus. Lord, move us by your Spirit to pour ourselves out by faith as we seek to, to join you in delivering others, to saving their souls and saving their lives. Empower us. Lord, I pray your blessing would be on us the rest of this evening as well as tomorrow. And would you give us favor with those in leadership. And Lord, may we see you glorified in our state and beyond as abortion is abolished. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>